Okay, hi. This is Pastor Barbara, a.k.a. Preacher with Parrots. Today is July 8th. This is Wednesday evening. It's our regular Bible study night on Wednesdays. We're in the Old Testament. We have quite an interesting class tonight. Because we're actually in the year about 860, 850 years before the birth of Christ. But we're going to go all the way back to the book of Genesis. Rather an interesting program. I think I'm going to go right to the history and get it out of the way before we go back to where we stopped last Wednesday we ended at um, the beginning of 2 Kings chapter 5 it was uh, July 1st and uh, let me go back to Genesis around the 20, 22nd chapter We're going to get some sensitive, some people will see it as sensitive, I see it as historical. What happened in history happened in history. But some people will see it as being sensitive. After we got through with Noah's flood and dealt with sin, we finally got where God called Adam, I'm sorry, called Abraham, who lived in Ur, not that far from the gates of the Garden of Eden. And God said, I want you and your wife, who was also his half-sister, they had the same father, different mothers. And I want you to go to a place that I will lead you to. You'll know you're there when I say you're there. In the meantime, just follow my directions. And God said, I'm going to create a people of you. From you will come a nation. Well, we know that Sarah was barren. Abraham, Sarah had a maiden, which was her legal property, just like these birds are my legal property. Uh, Tweety and Sweetie have had two clutches so far. The eggs that hatch into chicks are my property. I didn't lay the eggs. <laughs> I had nothing to do with the hatching of the eggs. But because the parents are my legal property, it worked like this in slavery in the history of our country. If you owned a slave and your slaves had children, then they were legally your children. So Sarah suggested that Abraham take her maiden uh, as a type of wife and have a child. That child would be the natural birth child of Abraham. He would be the father. But that child would be the legal property of Sarah because the mother, her handmaiden, was her property. So it must have seemed to them like a good idea. Except that wasn't God's plan. God's plan was not Abraham and whoever. God's plan was Abraham and Sarah. So the first child 
that's born. And this is very, very, very important in the Mideast. Um, especially among Muslims. You know that and we will get into it later on tonight when we get back into the divided kingdom. We're going to see where the firstborn, of course, becomes king and everybody else finds themselves dead. Firstborn was very important. They got the position. They got a greater proportionment of the money that was left to the family and so forth. After Ishmael, he was a young teenager, when Isaac was born, when God touched Sarah and healed her uh, inability to have children, Oh boy. Call from Private Caller. Okay. I hope that wasn't one of you. <laughs> um, so, Abraham's first child was with an Egyptian woman. And we know, because this is our second trip through the Bible. We've been doing this for going on nine years now. God's intention was to create a nation out of Abraham. Could have chosen anybody he wanted to, but this was his plan. So Ishmael is not Sarah's child. Ishmael. Ishmael's mother is the Egyptian handmaiden of Sarah. But it is Abraham's firstborn. Then, when he's going into his teenage years, Isaac is born of Sarah and Abraham. It is among Isaac that God intends to continue with this nation he's building. We have the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. One thing that the Muslims and other Mideasterners are very, very firm on, and we can't argue with it, I can't at least, that Ishmael was the firstborn of Abraham. And Abraham is as, is as important to the Muslims as Abraham is to the Jews. But God's plan for a nation of Israel came through or was to come through um, Isaac. Remember when Abraham took Isaac up to the top of the mountain and the scripture clearly says he took his firstborn. Muslims will argue that it wasn't Isaac that he took, but it was Ishmael. And that Ishmael and therefore the Arabs are Abraham's true people. Because of a fuss that went on between Ishmael and Isaac, Ishmael making fun of Isaac, uh, he was about four years old, more or less, uh, when uh, he was weaned. I know that's pretty old. Uh, there were reasons for it in those days. Like food was not as available. Uh, 
as it is nowadays. And being able to, uh, a mother to feed her child, uh, it was something that was done in those days. Keeping that in mind, Isaac grows up. Remember that Abraham sends his servant to go back to the land of Haran, which was the first place that God said, you go till I tell you you're there, and then you're there. That was Haran, named after Abraham's brother. Abraham understood his mission. Abraham understood he could not just create this nation with anybody. But with Sarah and with certain of their offspring. And so he gave his servant instructions on how important it was just to find the right woman. Now, Isaac... when he eventually gets a wife and then another wife. But when it's time for him to take his place in this, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord told the wife, you have two nations in your womb. She had twins. They would not result in being members of the same nation. One of them would be a Jew. And one of them would not be of the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we're talking about Jacob and Esau. Esau was the firstborn. And had things gone as they perhaps should have gone or were expected to go, things would have been very different. If you saw the picture that I put on Facebook and sent to some of you, you saw the picture of the soup, the porridge, red in color, supposedly. And when Esau thought he was hungry, Jacob was kind of a mama's boy. He liked to be in the kitchen and cook. Esau was a hunter. And he liked to do masculine things. But he was hungry and he wanted food. And whether it's food, whether it's something else we want real bad, sometimes we make very poor choices. And he chose the immediate satisfaction of getting food in his stomach over his birthright so that it was, had this incident not taken place, it would have been the God of Abraham Esau and whomever. Because Esau was the firstborn. But because he sold his birthright, it is now the God of Abraham, Isaac, and we're going to get to Jacob. So with Abraham, we've already got this switcheroo where the firstborn is not God's choice for the nation of Israel. But 
God did promise his mother, Hagar, I will make a nation of your son, and he will be a wild one. Now, you can take that, and you can go wherever um, you want with that. Um, if you want it to get as far as ISIS and so forth and take into consideration that the offspring of Hagar's son Ishmael would be wild and would be somewhat nomadic, you certainly can do that. Then we get to the second generation and we have, again, a birthright situation. Then we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob was a man that had 12 sons. the 12 sons of, Z of Jacob. His name was changed to what? His name was changed to Israel. So now we're talking God's plan for a nation to begin with Abraham. Then it would go to Isaac instead of Ishmael, in instead of Esau. And it would go to Jacob, who is now, his name has been changed to Israel. And now we have the beginning of this nation that God is going to create. Now, we've already got two groups of people that because of their heritage, are not happy with the children of Israel. Ishmael's offspring are not happy with the Jews. They feel Ishmael was the firstborn. They should have preeminence. They should be the predominant race. Then we go to that second generation of Jacob and Esau. And the people said, but what for a pot of soup? We would be that important nation. All of this, because of a pot of soup, we don't buy it. So we've got the offspring of Ishmael very unhappy as a people, Arabs, as a religion, Muslim, later, much later. Now we have the unhappy twin, the firstborn. He did the selling. He was the one with the earthly appetite, the hunger that had to be satisfied right away. Had no one to blame but himself. Nevertheless, he is seen as the firstborn. And now we have Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel. And Israel now is God's nation. The Ishmaelites are not happy with the situation. The Esauites are not happy with the situation. Well, where do these people live? Uh, I brought up a map. And I was going to put it on the tablet, and I don't know, something happened. Uh, I was going to email it 
to one of the email accounts I have on the tablet so I could show it to you. But if I could use this book and if this is Israel over here we have Edom Moab Mount Seir Syria over here we got a long, narrow country by the name of Egypt. What divides Israel from Moab, Edom, Mount Seir, Syria, is the Jordan River. Edom is where many, not all, many of the Ishmaelites, Abraham's firstborn of an Egyptian woman, live. Esauites those who were also the offspring of a firstborn who do not have the rights of the firstborn are also living in Edom. If you remember, I'm going to say about three or four months ago, on a Sunday morning, which I'm now using to preach whatever I feel like preaching as opposed to New Testament or Old Testament. I brought a message, the name of it is uh, The Battle Is Not Yours Remember that the king learned that armies from three nations were coming to fight Israel. And so he called a prayer meeting. And he said, we have to pray. Because three nations are coming against us. And remember that I told you that the man that God chose to speak to was not the king, it was not a prophet. But it was somebody from the tribe of Levi whose family name was Asaph. And everybody born into Asaph's family, their particular job in the tabernacle or temple was singing. So this was the offspring of Asaph, whose job in the temple was worship, but singing, either as a choir director or a singer in the choir. And this was the one that God chose to speak to. And I, I think that's wonderful. There's nowhere written God can only talk to priests. God can only talk to preachers. God can't use a song leader. God can't use anybody he wants to use. And God told him, the battle is not yours. If you didn't get that message, you might enjoy it. So go to Google and put in Preacher with Parrots and choose the YouTube option and go down until you find that particular message. What happened in that little bit of history? Well, what happened is this. God said the battle's not yours. These are people from, from where? From Eden. Moab, Mount Seir, 
people from these three nations, we're talking Ishmaelites, Esauites, people who felt they should be the leaders of an important nation, not the hangers on, somebody coming up. They all got together and they were going to do Judah in. Judah being the southern kingdom as opposed to Israel, the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom, which never had a king that served the Lord. Therefore, the people never served him. Instead, this was the southern kingdom of just Benjamin and Judah. They had some good kings, a few of them. Most of them weren't, but a few were. And this happened to be an occasion when they had a good king. And God, in fact, did handle it just the way you would expect God to handle it. Totally different from the way military people would have handled the battle. The choir was put up in the front. Usually the king would go in a chariot or whatever. You remember when David wanted to get rid of Bathsheba's husband? Uh, he arranged for him to go up in the front of the battle because those in the front of the battle were more likely to get shot or run through with a spear or a javelin or hit with a rock or a slingshot or an arrow shot through with a bow. And what actually happened in that occasion Edom and Moab got so upset in the battle that instead of killing off the Jews, they killed each other off. Did you ever get nervous and do something totally stupid? I do it all the time. I do it on this program sometimes. Um, remember when my friend Opel was on and I thought she was talking about the Old Testament and then Palabra and I said you're talking in two different you're, you're all mixed up and, and I was the one that was mixed up it happens well then there was only one tribe left and they killed themselves off see when God does things his own way, it's not our way. And things don't come out the way they would if it was being done our way. But it took, if I'm not mistaken, four days for them to gather up all the booty or all the spoil uh, of Moab, Edom, and those from Mount Seir. So... Coming back now to where we are in the divided kingdom, we're talking about Judah. Most of our stories are about Israel. Israel is going to disappear from the scene before uh, Judah does. Because they have a God that they have a king that never serves God, they are going to be taken into uh, captivity by the Assyrians. And we won't hear about them for some time. But Judah, who sometimes had good kings and sometimes served the Lord, they lasted a little longer. They eventually were taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And Babylon is now Iraq. That piece of geography, that piece of real estate that is now called, I, I, I'm sorry, Iran. Uh, that was Persia, and Babylon was Iraq. But we have more written about 
the ten tribes in the north because they were always into trouble. It was they who had more dealings with the better known prophets. We're actually going to get into one of the writing prophets today. We've had Elijah who didn't write a book and Elisha who didn't write a book. And um, uh, we had a couple of other prophets who did not write a book. We, if we get to it tonight, uh, and I can stay on track and get the job done properly, we will get to Obadiah. He wrote. He didn't write much, but he didn't write. Wow, can we talk? He didn't write much, but he wrote one chapter, which is the smallest book in the Old Testament. Now, we're studying the chronological Bible. Things in the order in which they happened. In another Bible, we have the order is different. And after we get through the books of history, and we get through the books of literature, like Esther, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. We get to the book of the prophets, but we don't get to them in our regular Bibles in the order in which they show up and do things. We get to them in the order of how much was written. So we get Isaiah and Jeremiah and some of those who wrote books that have, well, chapter 53 of Isaiah is very well known. That's a big, long book. And then those books which have between one and let's say six chapters like Jonah, Obadiah, um, and some of those, they are in the minor prophets because of how much they wrote or how little they wrote. So we're back now to Edom populated with people who had started out with the birthright, but for one reason or another did not end up as important people in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, whichever way we want to say it. Now, um, let's go to um, Second Kings eight. It's in Second Kings eight and Second Chronicles twenty one. We go back and forth between those two books. Uh, you know what? I just noticed over here. For some reason, I didn't have my um, my chat box list on. A lot of good it does me to give you instructions on how to call my attention to something, and then I don't even have it so I can see what's going on. I see the folks that we have with us um, tonight. And maybe when I get through teaching what is a very complicated lesson, uh, we can um, open our chat up to discussing some of that. Right now, we'll do very well to get through with it. So here we are, just across the Jordan River. See, it hasn't been that long ago that 
As a matter of fact, I remember uh, it was right after June 11. I remember I was in the other room teaching this lesson, and I remember getting something that I said, for right now, this sheet or whatever, a towel or whatever I had in my hand will be Elijah's mantle. It wasn't that long ago that Elijah said to Elisha, you want something? And Elisha said, yeah, I'd like to have a double portion of the Spirit of God that you've got. And Elijah said, okay, keep your eyes on me. Because if you see me at the time I'm taken away, if you are eyeballing me at the time I'm taken away, then I will give you what you're asking for. But you have to see it happen. He takes his mantle and he goes like that and the waters of the Jordan River. See, sometimes it's, I live in the mountains where for the last couple of years we haven't had a lot of snow, but when I first moved up here, we had a lot. And in the spring, when the snow melts, we have creeks and rivers that have a lot of water in them. Uh, down at the end of the summer, uh, very little water. And as we go into the winter, none at all. In some property up here, in when the real estate people uh, announce it or describe it, they say seasonal spring or seasonal creek or seasonal stream. There will be seasons of the year when you got a stream in your backyard and there will be seasons when you don't. All rivers come from melted snow in the mountains and it's pretty much that way everywhere. So when in Jordan, just north or then, across from the northern part of Israel, when the snow melts there in the mountains, the Jordan River up there uh, has a lot of water in it, especially certain times of the year. When you follow that Jordan River coming from Jordan, the country of Jordan, uh, all the way down, it has less and less and less water in it. When you get to the Dead Sea, it's dried up. It empties into the Dead Sea, and it didn't go anywhere. By that time, there's not that much. So Elijah took his mantle, and he did this, and the waters opened up just like they did at the Red Sea, just like they did at the Jordan River when Israel is finally moving through Edom country with the Ishmaelites and Edomites that really didn't want them going through there. And then the chariot comes and takes Elijah and as Elijah is going into the heavenlies, I said heavenlies, not heaven, because a number of places that are referred to as heaven, and I'm not talking about streets of gold and gates of pearl and uh, all of that. He's taken away, and his mantle is dropped over the side of the chariot, and because he has been eyeballing him, now the prophet Elisha sees it. He picks up that mantle. He takes that mantle and he does this. And the Jordan River opens up again. He walks across it. And that's when that large group of the sons of the prophets uh, realize that now there's a new prophet. It's not Elijah anymore.
So we have more things happening to that northern ten tribes because of the uh, bad kings that they had and because they had more prophets. Now we're in Judah in the southern part. All right. In the days of Edom, when Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah, and made a king over themselves. See, for a while, whoever was in charge of Judah, just across the river, was Edom. So Joram went over to Zaire, and all the chariots with him, and he rose by night, and he smote the Edomites, which compassed him about, and the captains of the chariots, and the people fled into their tents. Yet Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day. Now that doesn't mean till today, July, what did I say it was, the 8th? No, at the time this was written. Edom revolted against Judah. And Libna revolted at the same time. Now we're going to hear the same thing. But instead of from 2 Kings 8, we're going to get it from 2 Chronicles 21. It's just like when we go to the New Testament. New Testament begins with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when we study it chronologically, or you can buy books uh, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and... Uh, Again, you study by event. It's sort of a chronological thing also. And sometimes there's a place or two where all four mention something, but it's more than likely not. Uh, more likely than not that about two books Matthew and Luke, for example, might mention something. Or Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then John was, his writing was a little different. All right. So we're going to get about the same thing. In his days, the Edomites revolted from the dominion of Judah and made themselves a king. Then Jehoram went forth saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Why are you acting sad? Then come now to me, and he'll find out there's a prophet in Israel, northern tribe. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariot, and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Nothing like walking right up to the front door of the prophet. And Elisha sent a messenger out to him saying, go wash in the Jordan seven times. And your, I'm sorry. Um, Got to back up. Uh, what I did was half of the page of this particular portion of this particular Bible is about Judah and the other half is about Israel. I read the wrong column. So let me go back. In his days, the Edomites revolted under the dominion of Judah. And Jehoram went forth with his princes and all his chariots with him. And he rose up by night and he smote the Edomites, which compassed him and the captains of the chariots. So the Edomites revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day. The same time, so did Libna revolt from under his hand, because he had forsaken the Lord God of his fathers. Now, Elijah, not Elisha, Elijah, who has already gone in a chariot, but before he went, now we're in Second Chronicles again, He had prophesied a plague. He called it a famine. And there came a writing to him from Elijah the prophet saying, 
So Elijah is no longer with us, but something he wrote is still with us. Now, he didn't write a whole book, but he had written a little something out, and they're looking at it. Thus saith the Lord of, the, of uh, God of David thy father, because thou hast not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat your father, or in the ways of Asa king of Judah. There's another king now. Jehoshaphat was a good man. He was better than Asa. Remember Asa um, destroyed the altars of the pagan gods, but his son Jehoshaphat came and went one step, step farther. He even did away with the high places. But now the one who's king didn't. And he said, because you have not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat or Asa, king of Judah, but you walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, the ten tribes in the north that never had a king that served God, but they had a lot of good prophets. You've walked in the way of the kings of Israel, and you've made Judah and its inhabitants of Jerusalem go a-whoring like unto the whoredoms of the house of Ahab. Like Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel, killing off the prophets. And you've also slain the brethren of your father's house, which were better than you. Behold, with a great plague, the Lord will smite the people and your children and your wives and all your goods, everything you've got. And you'll have great sickness and disease in your bowels. Talk about irritable bowel syndrome. Until their bowels fell out by reason of the sickness of the day. Now we go back to where we continue in Second Chronicles. Moreover, the Lord stirred up against Jehoram, the spirit of the Philistines and of the Arabians that were near the Ethiopians. And they came up to Judah and they break into it. And they carried away all of the substance that was found in the king's house and his sons also and his wives so that there was never a son left him save Jehoahaz the youngest of his sons. Now, we have some judgments against Edom. And here's where we have the book of Obadiah. It's a very short book. It's only one chapter, and it's a short chapter. So we're in Edom now is being judged by God's prophet. Edom, where the Ishmaelites, some of them live, and the Esauites, the twin who sold his birthright. This is the vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We've heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise you, let us arise up against her in battle. Let's go to war, in other words. Behold, I've made thee small among the heathen. You're greatly despised. Obadiah, God's prophet, talking to the small nation of Edom, made up of people who had good reason in their own family history to hate uh, Judah, uh, to hate the Israelites. We are a rumor that an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise and go to battle. I made thee small among the heathen but you're greatly despised. People hate you. The pride of your heart has deceived you and everybody that dwells in the clefts of the rock. 
Edom is a very interesting country. There are a lot of caves. Um, you know that um, the Grand Canyon, if you can get a picture of it in your mind, uh, the Colorado River runs right through it. But there's a, a bridge. Uh, here you have a canyon side, and here you have another one, and then down the middle here you have the Colorado River. Now that was made because of years of, of the Colorado River. But if you can imagine a small country where there are a lot of huge walls and small spaces and caves and many hiding places and places where it's like almost impossible to go and get people out of there because of the way that the, the country is built. There's a hiding place when we get back into prophecy again, a hiding place where the Jews will kind of be hidden during the years of tribulation in that particular area. But he says, there are clefts in the rock. And who shall bring me down to the ground? Though you exalt yourself as an eagle. Oh, you really think you're somebody. And though you set your nest among the stars. Uh, way on top of, of some of those places. Maybe next Wednesday I'll try to read, see if I can find some pictures uh, I should have for tonight. Though you exalt yourself like an eagle and you have a nest among the stars, I will bring you down. If thieves come to you, if robbers come by night, how are you cut off? They would not have stolen until they had enough if the grape gatherers came to be. Would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Esau searched out? Now we're getting to who lives there. The descendants of, of Esau, who had to have his bowl of soup. How are things with them, the descendants of Esau? All the men of the Confederacy have brought you to the border. The men were at peace with you, and you, and they've deceived you and prevailed against you, that they may eat bread and lay a wound under thee. There is none, there is no understanding in him. Shall I not end that day when the Lord even destroyed wise men out of Eden? There's coming a day. And understanding out of the Mount of Esau. And mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of Mount Esau shall be cut off by slaughter. And now they're going to describe, and now we're in, we've done nine verses out of this one chapter, one book of Obadiah. So now we're in the 10th verse. But this is Edom's great sin. For your violence against your brother Jacob. See why I chose to get this story in this history out of the way uh, before we actually got into um, the divided kingdom now. I wanted to go way back to Ishmael and Abraham and Jacob and Esau. For thy violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. You will not be important. In the day that you stood on the other side, 
The other side of what? The other side of the Jordan River. In the day that strangers carried away captive his forces and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots over Jerusalem, even thou wast one of them. Remember those days? You've only got um, well, a few more verses in Obadiah. But this is the prophet Obadiah prophesying against Edom. You should not have looked on that day at your brother in that day. Neither should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. They were your enemies. So when they were destroyed, you were happy. You had a party. Because your offspring of your twin brother we're losing a battle. You shouldn't have spoken proudly in that day of distress. Oh, you're so happy because they who were your enemy are now having hard times. You should not have entered into the gates of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, you should not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither should you have stood in the crossway to cut off those that did escape. Neither should you have delivered up those that did remain in the day of the distress. You should not have a big holiday because the offspring of your twin brother was having a hard time. Now, the heathen nations are being condemned by God's prophet. Obadiah, and he says in verse 15, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As you've done, it shall be done unto you. Your reward shall return upon your own head. For as you've drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yes, you shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and it shall be as though they had not been there. Now we're on verse 17. When we get to 21, we'll be through with Obadiah. Obadiah is reminding them of their history. They themselves did not do these things, but it's part of their history. But upon Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. This place and these people that God has chosen, God has chosen them to be a nation of healing and of deliverance and of sanctification and of holiness. And the house of Jacob, your twin brother, he's talking to Edomites, but remember they are Esauites living in Edom. And the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. All that you have over here in Edom, it will now be possessed by the offspring of the twin brother of Esau, from whom you all are offspring. And the house of Jacob, Israel, shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph, a flame. And the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them. And there shall not be any remaining for the house of Esau, 
for the Lord has spoken it. Forget Esau. Forget any importance you think is in Edom. And they of the south, okay, up here we got the ten tribes, we call it Israel. Never had a king that served God, and now here we got two tribes. The south, the north. Lost my place. Nothing will remain in Esau, for the Lord has spoken it. And they of the south, the people of Jacob. They shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria and Benjamin shall, pronounce, shall possess Gilead. All right, let's look at these places. The ones in the south, Judah and Benjamin, where the temple is, where uh, Jerusalem, the capital is. Um, they will possess the Philistines, that strip of land over uh, by the um, Sea of, oh boy, met by the Mediterranean Sea. And that's where the Philistines were. He says, you're going to possess that. And the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria? Samaria is the capital of the northern tribe. And the captivity of the host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites unto uh, Zarephath. And the captivity of Jerusalem which is in Sarabad, shall possess the cities of the north. And this is the last verse. And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Now, um, I need to check something here and see where I'm going to go next. And I'm not going to go too much farther. So I'll be ending probably a little sooner. We'll have plenty of time to chat if we need to, uh, if we want to. Um, now we get back to what killed them off, the sickness of Jehoram. We're back in Second Chronicles. And after this, the Lord smote him in his bowels with an incurable disease. It sounds like, uh, you know, I'm a survivor of colon cancer. I know all about that disease. It sounds like what they had uh, is something I have never read of or heard of and when you have something like colon cancer you research uh, everybody that's had it in any of its forms so Jehoram they die and especially him of this bowel disease and Joash is born and becomes king at age seven. Now there's a dual reign where two are reigning together and there's a dual reign with Jehoram. Now we go to Second Kings, I'm going to go to where he reigns alone, and then uh, we're going to get there real soon, and then I'm going to quit for tonight.
were in Second Kings. And the eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab. Ahab, bad king. One of the northern kings. Bad king. Killed the prophets. In the eleventh year, Joram, the son of Ahab, began Ahaziah to reign over Judah. In the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, did Ahaziah, the son of Joram, the king, begin to reign. Why we have there twice in 29 and 25, I don't know. One is in the eighth chapter and one is in the ninth. But because it refers to the same event, they're written there together. Now we have the sickness and death of Jehoram. And it came to pass that in the process of time, after the end of two years, his bowels fell out by reason of his sickness. So he died of sore diseases. And the people made no burning for him like the burning of his fathers. There was no big funeral, no big deal like there had been for Asa and Jehoshaphat. They had served the Lord. This guy didn't. And he died a terrible sickness and I think they just, let's get it over with. In the twelfth year of Joram, son of Ahab, king of Israel, did Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, begin to reign. Now we go back to, that was in Kings, now we go to Chronicles, we're going to get the same thing. And it came to pass that in the process of time, after the end of two years, his bowels fell out by reason of his sickness, and he died of sore diseases, and the people made no burning for him like the burning of his fathers. Thirty and two years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years, and he departed without being desired. Nobody loved him. He died, so another guy died. No big funeral. How be it? They did bury him in the city of David, but not in the sepulchres of the kings. He did get buried where other kings were buried because he was a king. But he did not get buried, got buried in the same city and near the same place, but not in that line of sepulchres of the kings. And the rest of the acts of Joram and all he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? And Joram slept with his fathers, that means he died. And he was buried with his fathers in the city of David. <clears throat> and Ahaziah, his son, reigned in his place. And a couple of verses, and we will be through for many years. From here, we go back up to the northern part. So let me get this a little bit finished here. And the rest of the acts of, oh, they're written. He slept with this. Okay, now he reigns alone. Two and twenty years old, he's 22 years old, was Asahiah when he began to reign. And he reigned one year in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. So his mother was from the southern kingdom, his father from the northern. He did, he walked in the way of Ahab. Now his father and his grandfather were Jehoshaphat and Asa, good people. 
But he didn't do like them. He didn't follow their example. He followed the example of the wicked king from the north. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, as they did in the house of Ahab. For he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. Now we're back in Second Chronicles. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah his youngest son king in his place. The youngest son. Usually it's the firstborn, which is the oldest. For the band of men that came with the Arabians to the camp had slain the eldest. The eldest couldn't be king because the Arabians got there first and killed off the eldest. Forty-two years old. Actually, it's a mistake in the printing. It was 22 years old. When he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem, and we get again his mother's name. He walked in the ways of Ahab. For his mother was his counselor to do wickedly. He was made king of the south because of who his father was. But he was young when he began to be king. And his advisor was his mother from the northern tribes. Whereat he did evil in the sight of the Lord like the house of Ahab. And they were his counselors after the death of his father to his destruction. Now let me get the date. This is the eighth, right? Yes, yeah. seven, eight, fifteen, Wednesday p.m. This is where we take it up uh, next Wednesday. Now give me just a moment to clear up what I'm doing here on YouTube. <laughs> and um, I'll be then with my live group. We're one hour and 12 minutes into this program until our next video, Blessings on You.